Acts 16, beginning with verse 25. Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse number 25. I want you to follow along very closely, please. <laughs> Remember, you can never know what somebody says is the truth or not if you don't check behind them. We have too much uh, willful ignorance in religion today. That's why we have so many different churches with so many different things being taught because we willfully just let people tell us stuff without checking behind them and we assume they are right not realizing that they are human beings just like everybody else and they can easily make a mistake and easily mislead you. Jesus says in Matthew 15 that if the blind lead the blind, they both going to fall in the ditch. And he was talking to religious people when he said that. And so we have to check behind everybody who tells us something from the Word of God. In Acts 16, beginning verse 25, as Jonathan already read, it says, At midnight Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were loose, and the chains were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awakened from his sleep, seeing the prison door open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. See, back then, as a Roman guard, you were put in charge of prisoners. And if your prisoners escaped, you forfeited your life because of their escaping. And so this guy was getting ready to go ahead and kill himself to keep the magistrates from doing it to him uh, and just saving them a little time. He's going to go ahead and do the job for them. But as he drew the sword back to kill himself, uh, notice what it says in verse 28. Paul called out with a loud voice and said, loud voice and said, do not harm yourself, for we are still here. What if you had been locked up in prison and the doors of the jail cell flew open? Would you would have still been there? <laughs> 29, then he called for a light and he ran and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And on your sheet of paper that you have to fill out, that's the topic that I would like to speak to you on today. And that is, Sir, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? I already realized that in uh, religion there are uh, many ideas as to what people must do in order to be saved. I understand that. Not only in religion are there ideas and different ideas on what a person needs to do to be saved. We as individuals, we have our own ideas too. And here are some of those ideas right here. Some people say, well, I'm already saved and I know it. Some people say, why is this even important? I can go to heaven without worrying about whether I'm saved or not. Some people say, my preacher already told me I'm saved. Some people say, I don't know what to do. I'm confused. And some people are lost thinking they're saved and they don't even know they're lost. My question to you today is, what is your condition? Are you thinking that you're saved but are actually lost? Do you not care? Are you confused? Or nobody, has anybody ever told you what to do to become a Christian or what to do to receive salvation? Where are you today in your spiritual relationship with God? And we're going to attempt today to answer that question in our lesson. Now, why do you need salvation? Well, if you remember long ago in the Garden of Eden, we had two individuals. We had a man by the name of Adam. He was a good guy. And we had a young lady by the name of Eve. They were married. And one day Eve was out minding her own business in the garden, and she saw this wonderful tree with this wonderful looking fruit on it. And her husband had already settled down and told her, Eve, do not, you see that tree over there? Do not touch that tree. She said, okay, okay, boo. And, uh, and so she went out in the garden one day and she saw that tree and she thought about what her boo told her. And she said, man, I know what my boo told me, but boy, that tree looks too good. And Satan was there in, uh, uh, working on her through that serp uh, serpent. And she saw that tree, she saw it was good for food that it was pleasing to the eyes and the tree to make her wise. And the Bible says she took the fruit and ate, her, uh, and ate it. 
and, uh, and, and she gave him right to her husband, which means after she left and walked out of the house and went to searching for and went to looking around, he came right along behind her. By the time she made it to the tree, he was right there too before she even pulled off of it. And both of them started looking at the tree, and then she she pulled it off first, and she took a bite of it, and he was standing right there. And he said, how that taste, sweet? <laughs> and she said, I don't know, huh? I mean, she tastes good, huh? Taste. And the Bible says she handed it to him, and he took it right from her. No arguments anyway. He gave in. And this is when the first sin entered into the world. And this first sin that entered into the world separated the relationship that God and man had with each other. This is why God put man out of the Garden of Eden. Because the relationship that they had with each other was severed because of sin. This was the first sin that entered into the world. Okay? Now, the reason why it is important is because you need to understand that because of what they did, you need salvation today based on that one incident in the Garden of Eden. Everybody get your Bibles and turn over to Isaiah chapter 59 and follow along with me. Isaiah chapter 59 and we're going to look at verse 1 and verse number 2. Let me ask you this too before I get too deep into my lesson. Has God forgiven you of any sins in your life that you know of? If you say yes, I want you to tell me how you know he's forgiven you in your own mind. Did you pray to him and ask him for forgiveness? Did you go to church one day and stand up and confess to the people that were there that you, you wanted to be a new, new person and that from that moment you walked away and you felt like you, just, you just felt like you were new and felt like you were cleansed? How do you know God has forgiven you? How do you know you got an opportunity to go to heaven? Or vice versa, how do you not know that you hell by? In Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short and that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins has hid his face from you that he would not hear. I don't know if you ever thought about this. But if God has not forgiven you of your sins yet, you can't even pray to him. You know, we, we have this idea that anybody can pray and ask God for anything. That is a lie. That is a big lie. Look at this verse. God's ears are not heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins and your iniquities have hid his face from you that he won't even listen. It doesn't mean that you're out murdering and killing and stealing. That's, that, that doesn't mean that you don't have to be that kind of person to be disconnected from God. You can be a person who lied 10 years ago and had lied anymore and you can still be in your sins because of that one lie. If you have not found out yet what God has wanted you to do to get rid of your sin. Ain't no such thing as, oh, you're sin bigger than mine. Sin is sin. I know we harp a lot of times about one sin, and, and we talk about this sin, and we don't mention all the other, but sin is sin. Sin is sin. Two homosexuals, that sin is just the same as a person lying to somebody. But abortion is just, is, is just as great a sin as uh, 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 are you going down the, uh, the street stealing a lollipop out the gas station. The same thing. Both of them cause you to lose your soul. Now, all of them have different repercussions upon society. That's a different subject. But the consequence of the sins in the sight of God is the same. You can lose your soul behind sin. And so if you've ever told a lie in your life, if you've ever did anything wrong in your life, you need to know how to get rid of your sins. And if you haven't gotten rid of them the way the Bible says, you are still in your sins, you are still separated from God, and your prayers are not getting through to God. It's a dangerous thing to live in this world not being able to get your prayers through to God. It's a very dangerous thing. So I beg you to listen very carefully so that this right here will not mess up your chance at heaven. Now, who came to bring this salvation? Y'all get your Bibles if you will and turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we're going to start at verse 16. John chapter 3. We're going to start at verse number 16. 
John chapter 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. By the way, before I comment on that, number one, what separates us from God? Put sin, and then I want you to write the verse so you can have a reference. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. The answer is sin, and then put Isaiah 59, verses 1 and verse number 2. Sin, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. All right. Who came to bring salvation? Or who brought salvation, number 2? Jesus. John 3, 16 and 17. John 3, 16 and 17. Now let me show you something about this verse because people love quoting this verse to try to show you that everything's all right. All you got to do is believe. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God sent Jesus to save us. And you must believe in Jesus to be saved. But notice, that's not the only thing you have to do. For instance, if believing in Jesus is the only thing you have to do simply because that's what this verse says, then that means you don't have to confess his name. That also means you don't even have to repent of your sins. You don't have to change your life. You don't have to do anything in your life. Just believe. Well, you know that's not true. Because you have to change and you have to confess his name. So why does this verse say who have believed? Here's why. Belief and faith is the foundation for you coming to God. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to, to come to God. For he that comes to God must first believe. Why? Because belief and faith in God is what prompts you to do everything else he wants you to do in life. You know what? You know what? If you believe in God and you sincerely believe in God, you don't have any problem being faithful to Him. You don't have any problem coming to service like you're supposed to. You don't have any problem treating people kind. And even if you fail and make a mistake, you don't have any problem saying, I'm sorry, trying to fix it. Why? Because your belief in God prompts you to do everything else He wants you to do. If you don't have any belief in God, then guess what? You're not going to do the other things He wants you to do in your life. So belief is the foundation, but it's not the only thing you have to do to be saved. And I'm going to show you that as we move forward. So the question now becomes, since we know sin separates us, and since we know Jesus came to save us, the next question is this right here. How do we get that salvation? Watch this on the board right here. Notice how beautiful this is. Man is separated from God because of sin. But when the cross of Jesus came on the scene, watch what happens. The cross of Jesus showed up on the scene, and watch what happened to sin. Sin ran away, and then Jesus filled the space where sin used to be, and now man has access to God through Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says, And all things are of God, who have reconciled us to himself through Jesus. Meaning, you cannot get to God unless you go through Jesus. Muhammad is not going to do it. Some preacher is not going to do it. You're not going to do it. The only way you get to God is you've got to go through the Son. You don't go through the God uh, through the Son. You can't get to God. That's how I know. I love I love all my friends who are Muslims and uh, in the Islamic religion, but all of them uh, will tell you right now that Jesus is not the Savior. You cannot get to God through anybody else but through Jesus. That's it. And we cannot be ashamed to tell people that. But we ourselves must first believe. Now, the question once again, what must I do to be saved? I'm getting ready to go through a list of things that the Bible gives us to do in order to have our sins forgiven. And I want you to be honest with yourself today. And I want you to honestly ask yourself, have you done it? The way the Bible says do it. The, the exact way the Bible says do it. Don't say, 
Well, I think I have. I don't say, well, I just hate to admit it because I, no, you need to be honest. Your soul is important. And you don't need to sit around here and argue with your soul and argue with your conscience. If you know you have not done it the way the Bible says, let me tell you something. All these churches you see around here are not telling you the truth. Some of them are. Some of them not. But anybody that tells you something different from what the Bible says, they are putting your soul in jeopardy. Now, ask me which ones are telling the truth, which ones are not. I don't know. I have to go in them and see. Now, I do know a couple because I've talked to a couple of preachers in the area. But other than that, I can't know what's going on in every church. But you can because all you got to do, all you have to do is pick this up and follow along or just start questioning people. What must I do to be saved? And see, do they give you the answers God gave you? That's all you have to do. What must I do to be saved? Well, number one, you must learn about God. Write that down and then write the verse for it. John chapter 6. 44 through 45. You must learn about God. If nobody has never, has ever, hasn't ever taught you about God and what God sent Jesus here to do and what Jesus actually did while he was here for you, then how in the world can you say that you're saved and that you've been forgiven of your sins and you don't know anything about the one who's supposed to be forgiving you? Man, if somebody let me borrow some money, especially if it's $10,000, I want to know who they are and I want to know something about them. Not gonna just take money from anybody, you know. Uh, that you know they that's how they do in prison. They give you some. They don't even tell you how to pay them back. They just they don't take. Don't even worry about. It. When they say don't worry about it, you gonna say uh huh? Because in that part, don't worry about it. That means I figure out how y'all want you to pay me back later on. So if somebody gonna loan me some money, I wanna know something about it. I wanna know are they in the mob or are they in the banking business? Sometimes it's no different, but you you know, I don't want somebody in the mob lending me money and then I, and for the rest of my life, I cannot get away from it. For the rest of my life, I am indebted to the mob and the only way I can get out of it is lose my life. I want to know who I'm uh, borrowing money from. In the same way with God, I want to know who this, the, who, who this person called God is that's supposed to be forgiving me. I want to know, is he real? I want to know, is he credible? I want to know, what has he done for other people in their lives that proves he's going to do the same for me? And you find all that information right here. John 6, 44 through 45 says this right here. No one can come unto me unless the Father who has sent me draws him. I raise them up in the last day. It is written in the prophet, they shall be all taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has learned, heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You cannot come to God unless you first learn things about God and about Jesus. That's the, that's the first step. What's the second step? Those things that you learn from God, you must do this. You must believe it. You must believe it. That's very important. John 8, 24. You must believe it. John 8 and verse number 24. If you don't believe it, then it's not going to do you any good. John 8, verse 24 says this here. Therefore I say unto you, you will die in your sins. If you do not believe I am he, you will die in your sins. Belief is important. Once you have that faith and belief in what you've learned about God, that's going to cause you to do some things. The first thing it's going to cause you to do is sit down and examine your life. And you're going to sit down at the table and you're going to say, what areas of my life do I need to change? Am I treating people the right way? Am I lying to people? Am I doing things I know I'm supposed to do? then your belief in God is going to cause you to do a U-turn. In the Bible, it's called repent. And you're going to be going in this direction, and you're going to say, I, I want to change my life. And you're going to say, hey! And you're going to make that illegal U-turn in the middle of the highway. This is the only time I am telling you to break the laws of driving. In the middle of the road, do a U-turn. 
I think that's illegal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It doesn't say not. Some places. It doesn't say not to make yeah. a U-turn. Oh, only if it says not. Well, I'm talking about on the road that says do not make a U-turn. <laughs> I'm on that road. <laughs> because that's, a, that's Satan's highway. Satan, Satan wants to keep you on that road that says don't make a U-turn. And I want you to go against Satan's uh, law. And make a, God wants you to go against Satan's law and make a U-turn. That's repentance. Notice Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13. This is a beautiful verse right here. One of my uh, favorite verses in the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 13. This tells you all you need to know about forgiveness and about what God can do for you. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 13. Notice what it said. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and for saints, that's turn around, repentance, them will have what? Mercy. Mercy. If you sit around here saying to yourself that I don't have anything that I need to be forgiven of, if you sit around here and argue with your conscience for the rest of your life, you will never find mercy from God. And even in your personal life, you may not even prosper. And so you have to be very, very careful that you understand that any denial of the sins you have in your life it is akin to you covering up your sins. You can't cover up your sins. And you can't even hide from God when you're committing your sins. It's impossible. You know, we, we as human beings, you know, let's just say, for instance, I got a problem with alcohol or something, and I duck and dodge everybody, and I finally get to that one spot that I've been looking for, that dark spot in my house, in the back room, and, I, uh, and, and I've hid from everybody. And now I got that bottle. And boy, I'm smiling. And I pop that top. You can smell the fragrance of the Jim Beam just flow out. And I get it, and I look. Nobody's around. And I turn it up right in God's face. All because I fail to realize I cannot hide my sin from God can't do it, no matter how you try. There's nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. A person of integrity will admit that they have a problem with things in their life that they need to get rid of. And then they would get rid of it and allow God to cleanse their lives. That's what repentance is. Belief not only causes you to turn and repent, but belief causes you to do something else too. Confess Jesus' name publicly to everyone who's listening. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 and 10, Paul gives us those instructions. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and verse number 10. Notice what it says. If you confess with your what? Mouth. Mouth. The Lord Jesus. And, notice now, belief has been added to another word here. Now, no longer can we just use John 3.16. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, you know, this is where many churches stop with confession. Many churches say, all you have to do is confess and accept Jesus into your life as your personal Savior. And pray this prayer with me, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've been living my life wrong. But now I forsake all my sins and follow you. Hallelujah, amen. You're saved. Everybody give God glory. And the person is saved. Let me say this as nice as I can. You don't find that foolishness anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible has anybody ever confessed Jesus as their personal Savior, said a prayer, and was saved. Nobody. <coughs> Not under the law of Christ. Nobody. That is a man-made idea that is convenient for people. It's convenient. Oh, 
Oh, we can't reach those people out there in TV land, but you you watch it on TV land, put your hand on the screen for me. If you watch it on the internet, put your hand on the monitor for me and say this prayer. It's all about convenience. All about convenience. This is not found in the Word of God. Because after you confess Jesus, there's still something left to do. And we find it in all these verses that I want you to turn with me so you can see for yourself. And you know what? This last thing is not very popular. And you know why it's not popular? Because it's not convenient. Man, who wants to get in all this? Who wants to get in water? Especially on the lady side. Have you spent $70 and had your hair done too? Please. Who want to get in water and mess that up? <coughs> and guys, you know, we, we prideful guys. You know, men, it takes a lot to make us bow down. And what man want to say I've seen and, and get in that water and let somebody else handle him? I mean, the men want people handling them. Putting me under the water, I'm a man, boy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Let me put you under the water. <laughs> and Acts chapter two, beginning with verse number thirty-eight, on the day of Pentecost. As a matter of fact, let's just back up to verse thirty-seven. <coughs> Acts two thirty-seven. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to the Peter and the rest of the apostles, "Men and brethren, what shall we do?" Let me show you how every denomination and every church in Birmingham can be one when it comes to how to become a child of God and how to be forgiven. If we all would just repeat what Peter said, we all can be one. Don't repeat what Tony ever said. Let's just repeat what Peter said. Now look at verse 38. What did Peter say? Repent and let every one of you be what? Baptized in the name of Jesus for what? For the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If every preacher in Birmingham said verse 38, when a person wanted to know what to do to be saved, we all could be one. Now let me ask you a question. How many people told you to do that to be forgiven? How many people told you to do it and told you to wait to get baptized? Look at verse 41. Those who gladly received his word were baptized three weeks later. <laughs> the same day they were baptized the same day and the reason why they were baptized the same day is because of verse 47 praising God and having favor with all the people the Lord added to the word the only way you can be a part of the church is you've got to go through the water that's it that is the only thing that puts you in Christ the church is the body of Christ, and for you to be clothed with Christ, you must go through the water. That's why in Mark 16, 16, notice what Jesus says. Turn over there to Mark 16, 16. Mark 16, 16. Mark 16 and verse number 16. We got one more thing that's added to belief. Right here. Mark 16 and verse 16. Notice what it says. He who believes and is what? Baptized. Baptized shall be what? Saved. Saved. And he who does not believe shall be what? Amen. Mark 16, 16. I had a person tell me this. See? This verse says, Believe, he who is believed and is baptized shall be saved. But it did not say, but the one that is not baptized and doesn't believe is condemned. It just simply says the one who doesn't believe is condemned. Meaning, you can, you can believe, you can believe, and you don't have to be baptized. So Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he did not say, but if you're not, if you don't believe and if you're not baptized, you're going to be condemned. He just said, if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. Let me show you why. That's, that's improper grammar. And I know about improper grammar because I speak it all the time. It's just like saying this right here, and I've used this before. 
The baby that drinks milk and digests it will live. But the baby that does not drink milk and does not digest it will not live. That doesn't make sense. Let me show you why. If you don't drink it, how can you digest it? It doesn't make sense to say digest it on the second sentence because you got to drink it to digest it. He who drinks and digests will live, but he who does not drink will die because he ain't got nothing to digest. The same thing it is with baptism. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be damned. Why? Because the person that does not believe is not going to be baptized. They don't want to be. In order for a person to get right here, they got to have something right here. Or as we like to point, right here. And that's faith. Faith causes you to repent. Faith causes you to confess. And faith causes you to be baptized. And the reason, and what are you baptized in? Baptized in, baptized in the Holy Spirit? No. The Holy Spirit is something that God gives all of us, but we're baptized in something different. Look at Acts 10, 47. Acts 10 and verse 47. Watch this. Y'all ever heard that old song? Take me to the water. Take me to the water. <laughs> yeah, the water. You got to go. Look at verse 47 after Peter finished preaching to Cornelius. Can any man forbid what? Water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we. And in verse 48, and he gave them an option to be baptized. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says he commanded them to be baptized. Why is that important? Well, the last verse. Here's why. Look at Acts 22, 16. Here's why, because this is what baptism does. I don't know why God chose to use water to accomplish his goals. I don't know why, and I don't really care. I don't know why God used the church and us gathering together to worship him, to accomplish his goals. I don't know why, and I do not care. I don't know why Jesus chose to spit in the clay and mix it up with his spit and put on a blind man's eyes and heal this man when he could have just spoke to the guy and healed him. I don't know why, and I really don't care. I don't know why God told uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Naaman in, in the book of 2 Kings to go down to the dirty Jordan River and dip seven times to get rid of his lepers when all God had to do was heal the man right there standing at his house. I don't know why God told him to do that, and I don't really care. Isaiah 55, 89 says, God weighs are above my ways, his thoughts are above my thoughts. And for me to understand why God does stuff sometimes is beyond me. I don't know why God does stuff the way he does it, and I do not care. All I know is when God does stuff, it is right. Acts 22, 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and what? Wash away, Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Listen. I... You, got, you have a choice to make in your own life. There's a good choice and there's a bad choice. A bad choice would be for you to read all of this information that we read today <laughs> and to know you haven't done it this way and lose your soul. The good choice is for you to read all this information today and for you to say, you know what, I have not done it that way. I haven't even heard it that way. But I, I, not, I, know, I not only heard it that way today, I actually saw it with my own eyes. And for you to say, I need to do this the right way. It's best to be safe than sorry. It's best to be safe than sorry. And I beg you that if you are here today and you have not, be, and you have not done this the way God said do it, maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe God directed you to be here at the services today because he wanted you to have an opportunity to hear something that you've never heard before. You know, many times we look for blessings from God and sometimes we miss out on the blessings because they're so small. But maybe some of the things that you've been praying for in your life, some of the situations you've been praying for in your life, 
Maybe God directed you here today because you becoming a child of God may be a portal for God answering the prayers that you've been asking him for. I would think about that in my life if I was you. I beg you that if you're here today and you have not done it the way God said do it, don't play Russian roulette with your life and hope that you make it to heaven. You can know for a fact that you are a saved child of God if you do what you saw with your very eyes today that you need to do.